Welcome to our podcast series on the subject of board leadership and governance. I'm Richard Calland. I'm an, a fellow of the Institute for Sustainability Leadership at Cambridge and a professor of public law at the University of Cape Town. In the series so far, we began with Maria Yott, a Danish asset manager, investor, and a member of several boards in the European Union. Her perspective was around the importance of the board in terms of bringing together sustainability strategy with commercial strategy and the particular responsibility that that brings for board members. With Philippe Joubert, another fellow of the Institute in the second of the series, I discussed the relationship between the board and the executive and how that has shifted over the years. And of course, Philippe brings not just a, an extraordinary range of expertise behind him and serving on many boards around the world, but he has this very powerful message about how the end of business as usual means that board leaders must really think differently about how they will help their companies, their organizations move into a very different era with huge demands, huge risks, but also huge opportunities for those who get that transition right. In this third in our series of interviews in this podcast series about board governance and leadership, I'm joined by Victoria Hearth, who is a fellow of the University of Cambridge's Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and also a visiting fellow of the University of Cambridge's Judge Business School. Victoria has an interesting history on the marketing side of business, but also in the last 10 to 20 years on the sustainability side. And she has a very particular and deep, passionate perspective on the role that governance plays in bringing these things together. She believes that governance is the glue that binds purpose with strategy, with execution. And I'm going to be discussing that in the context of what we see as the rising and extremely important role that board leaders can play in getting sustainability strategy right to ensure that organizations and companies can adapt to the extreme pressures of the current external world, climate change and all. Victoria, thank you very much for joining me for this third in this series of interviews in our podcast series on board leadership and governance. And welcome, you're in Cyprus, I understand. I'm in Cape Town, South Africa. So we're speaking across a longitudinal axis here of 6,000 miles, but really good to have this opportunity to talk to you. Let's start with governance. What do you mean by governance? Because it means different things to different people. And when we talk about a board and its place in the governance system or ecosystem, even, we need to think about that ecosystem before we actually hone in on the board. Okay, so defining governance has always been one of those ongoing things and there's no one clear definition. In fact, you know, if we go to the codes that are out there, there tend to be sort of like a page of description about governance. And I think that's the case for a reason. Of course, we had the Cadbury definition of direction and control, but the definition of governance is something that we debated at length in the ISO governance committee that I chaired for five years. Some people didn't even want to create a standard unless we had a definition of governance. And then on the other hand, I was pointing out, well, aren't we going to be defining governance? And so at the end, we might know whether we can turn that into a pithy sentence. But ultimately, there are different ways in which you can describe what we're talking about here. But in terms of organizational governance, I think that I do have to defer to the global consensus that we arrived at, which is governance of organizations. It's a human-based system by which an organization is directed, overseen, and held accountable for achieving its defined purpose. So that is really the essence. And in there, you have those two aspects of direction and what Cabri called control, but we debated that one at length. And it was at the consensus is that we can talk about controls, but actually we're talking about oversight here. And in terms of hierarchical dominance, rules-based was a better term. And then of course, accountability, which was all in Cadbury, but is really brought to the fore in the standard. So let me interrupt you briefly. We'll come back to those terms because they're really important. And I found them extremely valuable in trying to frame what we mean by leadership and governance in a boardroom uh, setting. I'll come back to that, but let's digress briefly. And ISO standards, ISO as an organization of what one might call soft law, international global standards. Can you just tell us a bit about that? Some of our listeners might not be familiar 
with the ISO standards and your own particular role in developing that new standard, particularly ISO 37000? You're right. I think a lot of people have heard of ISO, but don't necessarily understand it. And my view, cutting to the chase, is that actually in the crisis of humanity we find ourselves in, where we have a severe lack of global governance mechanisms, ISO is one that we need to, I think, quickly understand and get behind and utilise, because it's actually one of the best facilities we have for navigating what we are going through as a global community of humanity. And that's because it started in sort of the post-war period, really. It had existed as an organization before that. But ultimately, it is a series of 167 now, I believe, national member bodies, which are sort of national sanctions standardization organizations. They're not part of government, so they're one stage removed, but you have that really critical connection with the government of a country. And so ISO is like a governing group where all of the sort of different member bodies come together and nation states can, through that mechanism, propose that a certain standard should become an ISO. So in essence, both at the national level and at ISO level, we're talking about a highly refined process of consensus building. That's really all that it is. And I think it's important to remember that because then it makes a lot more sense when people think, oh, oh, you know, BSI, blah, 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 that's the plug stuff or ISO, you know, 14,001, that's quality. So there are certainly standards that have like raised into the consciousness. But what we need to remember is this, this is really about saying on any topic, what is it that the world agrees on a topic? So hugely important facility. I've done a lot of work in standards building on sustainability for BSI around particularly sustainable communities. And then I was the lead expert on sustainable city indicators, which was a way of sorting out the mess of rankings of cities on sustainability by saying what 100 best metrics. And then I moved into the role of convener and actually co-convener of working group one within what's called a technical committee on governance of organizations. So that started just as I got involved and any sort of technical committee that starts, a country sort of proposes that and becomes the secretariat. And in this case, it was the UK. So I was their designated convener or project manager for building this first international ISO standard in governance of organizations. So it had never been done before. Essentially, ISO had done a lot in widgets in the old days, trying to sort of harmonize trade and cut costs. Over time, had started moving much more into the sort of behavioral decision-making realm, like environmental management or quality, because there was a real demand for that. So it became also by that less tick boxing and more principle-based as organizations were trying to standardize and move cultures through different ways of doing things. And a lot of those are what we call management system standards. So they really are plug and play and you have to conform to a certain structure. So ISO 37000 fills a gap, it seems to me, listening to you in two ways. One, it's a soft law. It's not legally binding. It's voluntary. It's guidance, as you say. But it helps fill the gap that international governance and the rule of law often struggles with, which is to create transnational international standards that people can hold on to and therefore have consistency across geographical and different jurisdictions. And the second gap is around exactly what governance means as a standard for an organization that is trying to deliver transformation and have the right rules of the game in place at this particular time in history. Now, back to what you and your colleagues with this extraordinary multi-stakeholder consensus that you achieved, which gives it real credibility, I have to say, and real legitimacy, and I think adds to its value. What you achieved was this set of words, which I think is really helpful. The first word in that long sentence is that the governance responsibility starts with the direction of the organization. And then secondly, the oversight, and thirdly, being accountable. And we can break those down, but the next bit of the sentence is also really important because it says to direct, oversee, and be accountable for achieving the defined purpose of the organization. So the relationship between governance and purpose, defined purpose, I think is critical there. Can we add one other word, strategy? How would you see this triangle of governance, strategy, and purpose? 
unfortunately, I'm trying to get the standards to be made for free, but you can get some detailed summaries online and you can see the whole governance framework that's in the system, which has purpose at the centre, but has 10 other principles, one of which is strategy. And in the document itself, it really unpicks quite clearly the role of strategy. So for me, having studied management since like 1995 and all the confusion around the terms of strategy and vision, no wonder everyone's confused. So I really like to try and boil things down because I think often we're all saying pretty much the same thing. What we're saying is any organization is something you're trying to achieve, your goal, your purpose, and the parameters within which you achieve that. Now, strategy is how you achieve your ends within those parameters. And governance essentially sets the ends and sets the parameters. So throughout the whole of the standard, you'll see the term achieves the purpose in the way intended in order to achieve the purpose in the way intended. And the way intended is the manner, the mode, the parameters, the guidelines, the red lines, whatever you want to talk that, you know, about. And actually, this is probably something listeners might find really helpful as well. My co-convening colleague, Axel Kravatsky, who together we chaired this process, he's based in Trinidad and Tobago and a real governance expert. He really enlightened me when he brought to the table the fact that in effect, the governing body is completely, utterly accountable for the whole organizational system. So you can take the starting position that really they start from doing everything and then they decide to delegate certain things. Now, it's just normatively the case about what a CEO role is, about what the executive role is and that sort of line between governing body and executive. But ultimately, at all levels, you'll be wearing hats, a governing body hat and an executive hat, especially if executives are sitting on the board. And again, that's something that tends to get lost. So what matters then is that strategy is this sort of normatively the bit where the governing body's role and the executive role sort of comes together. So in the standard, it's really, really clear about strategy that the governing body need to set the strategic objectives that are justified against the purpose, i.e. if this is our purpose, these are the objectives that we think, if met, will achieve that purpose. Here is our governance policies around um, what we think are the parameters to do that. Executive, go away and create strategy. And again, there are different ways of thinking about this. Some are very purists that say, you know, go off and create strategy. Governing body should have no role in that strategy because otherwise, how can they truly hold executive to account? For others, that's much more of a blurry line. And in the standard, global consensus was one that said, actually, the governing body need to lean in to engage with the strategy, certainly to be able to make sure that the governing levers that it's pulling are supporting the delivery of that strategy that they have in one way or another, they will sign off. So I tend to agree with you, Victoria, when, when one thinks about that word direct, it seems to be very hard for a governing body to direct an organization without entering the sphere of strategy and the big strategic choices. I mean, if one thinks of strategy as really about identifying really difficult dilemmas, tough choices, if you like, and resolving them by making a choice, really that sort of guidance and direction, I would say, should come indeed from the board. Now, I'm using board. You've been talking about the governing body because, of course, organizations come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some are for profit, some are not for profit. In the case of a for profit, generally, the governing body is the board and the board of directors. So let's hone in on that in a corporate setting. What would you say would be the major implication of ISO 37000 for corporate boards now thinking about their leadership responsibilities, their legal duties, and their obligation to govern in a way that allows the organization to achieve its purpose? You probably know I'm not a fan of the, the terms not-for-profit and for-profit because I think it basically belies what we really mean is profit maximization. And that's actually the thing that is being un unpicked as we speak, of course. But I would say 37,000, what, what it really does, what makes it different to the other things that are out there? So the closest before this, I'd say, would be the OECD guidelines, which are also really important guidelines. They're very much written for a regulatory audience. What ISO 37000 does is really speak to, 
organizations, so organizations of any size or any type, the issue is that you don't really have anything. It helps you think about governance as a practice, as a discipline, about what are we really here to do. You instead have these kind of scatterings and pockets of guidance in different stock exchanges in different parts of the world, and then some areas just with nothing in it. So it really provides that bridging role. But more than that, what it does is, I'd say it's the first time that we have something where the world came together and said, what do we think is good governance of organizations for the organizations that we need that can deliver the value that's required, the true value that's required? And so when we understand that the discipline of governance, whilst it goes back a couple of thousand years, is actually really, really young, especially compared to management, and that it's grown up in a time of business as usual. In other words, a very specific view of how we should run the economy that preferences financial income capture for the shareholders, sorry. In writing, both what do we think is the essence of good governance that's being born now, but also doing it for any organization, which means that we had to get back to the conceptual roots. This had to be relevant for a one person organization or the largest corporate ever. And so the lessons I think are similar across all of them. What they say is governance is a specific discipline. It needs to be understood as a set of key principles and functions that you need to undertake. There are 11 that we can distill it down into and that these will not be unfamiliar at all in any way. And we lean on the status quo, but there will be ways of interpreting that to sort of bring to the fore what, in other words, it, it otherwise was sort of hidden from view. So putting an absolute emphasis on, for example, oversight. What do we mean by it? What's the role of the audit committee? How should we think about that? Accountability, both internal delegation and reporting and all the finer details of that, being really clear about what value as a governing body you are trying to create. Now, that's something we've seen in integrated reporting and in this sort of multi-capital view. But ISO 37000 gives it a name. There's a principle there. And it comes before strategy as one of those foundational principles. Although I have to say, other than purpose, there is an order. There are foundational principles and supporting principles. But also, for example, principle 11 on viability and performance over time, that's something that, especially in CISL, we're very familiar with in terms of understanding the system of dependencies that sit around you, understanding is to have enough stocks and flows of the right capitals at the right time in the right way. Again, stuff that we know is critical if you're going to be governing any organization, but ISO 37000 really brings it to the fore. We talk about risk management and there's a brilliant ISO standard on risk management. What this does is say, well, yeah, but that risk management needs to be governed. And including making sure that you're applying good risk management as a governing body to the functions that you are you know, facilitating. So, I mean, I could go on and on. All I would say is a huge amount of rich detail in there. And of course, on your point about risk governance, which I think is a very useful expression, if you are accepting, as you have to, I think now in this era, that as the board, you are accountable for the organisation that you govern, that comes with very high level legal responsibilities and increasingly as public interest litigation, particularly in the climate space, opens up and extends across the world. It opens up a huge sort of area of legal risk if you have not done your due diligence, but more than due diligence, if you haven't properly looked out of the window, understood the context, asked your executive the right questions at the right time, and really as a board applied your mind properly to what the company is doing or not doing. That's where we're moving into, and I think we're at a real juncture. And ISO 37000 really exposes that juncture. I mean, these are 11 really specific sets of principles and behaviors that all governing bodies, even if you're a one person organization, need to be doing. And so if we take that, as being the future in a way. It tells us something about the kinds of organizations the world wants to bring about and how they're governed. And then we look at the realities of the expectations of governing bodies, remembering that that governance has really been focused on 
um, and if anyone hears me say middle of the triangle, some of you will know what I mean, some of you don't, but that sense that we have trapped organizations into really saying, look, don't worry, it's a complex world out there, but don't worry, you just really mostly need to focus in on financial capital. You need to account for it, measure for it, create strategy against it, you know, you'll be held accountable for it. And then that's kind of broadened out slightly. But what we're now saying is actually, organizations take resources and transform them and you as a governing body are accountable to society really this is where we're going you're accountable to society for the resources that you use and how you use them and what as a result that you create in the world and ISO 37000 really sets out that future the current reality is built for a different world and a different time and one that frankly is dragging the whole community <laughs> down with it. So if we don't realize that this is not just tweaking some governance behaviors, this is about rethinking what is the role of a director of a governing body? How should we be thinking them as part of the organization? I think we are going to struggle because if we're going to put money and effort anywhere, really, we shouldn't be betting on horses. We should be creating really strong governance frames within which we can free innovation from rules and constraints and bets. So Victoria, that puts governance right at the center of the transformational journey that the world needs to take right now and very, very urgently. And I think you're absolutely right in saying that it's often seen as kind of tinkering around the edges fiddling with the decision making. But if it's seen in those limited terms, then it really is going to be fiddling whilst Rome burns, literally. And that's not helpful. So decision makers with that legal responsibility at the head of any organization have got to take governance extremely seriously and think through the implications for their decision making. I've got one last question, which is around power. I know that you, from earlier conversations we've had, you expect, as do I, that boards should step up to this uh, high level responsibility. But it assumes that they have the wherewithal, the power, and of course, the inclination to do so. I've spent much more time in my life and experience with governance working in public governance rather than private governance. And it seems to me there's an analogy here with the relationship between the legislative branch of government and the executive branch of government. In theory, and in most constitutions, the legislative branch has more power and authority. It elects, appoints, and has a responsibility and an obligation and an opportunity to oversee and hold to account the executive. But in reality, the power tends to sit very much with the executive. So also with companies, that the real power sits with the executive. And are we not perhaps being unrealistic in our expectations of what a board can achieve? We've arrived at a situation where the power tends to sit with the executive, but that's not what the system is designed to do, actually. So I think what we have over time is we have successful CEOs often who then move into the board level or executives that become executive directors and fail to understand that when they enter that governing body, they become part of a unitary decision making unit. And so over time, what that means is that as those executives who have been used to having maybe boards rubber stamp certain decisions, not as too many questions, you know, the, unless it comes to finance, they then themselves perpetuate that system and just assume that if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know, if you've got a CEO that looks like they're doing a good job, why would you worry too much? I'm over characterizing here. I know there are lots of boards that don't operate like that, but ultimately, we are going to have to move to a different level of understanding the role of the governing body. And it's in a way, this is nothing new. It's just remembering what's already there in the system. Because if we are accounting for the right kind of CEO and the right kind of senior executives that just happen to be there, the idea that governing body will pick up the worst issues, we're never going to be able to make the level of transformation. I mean, even just stopping the harm, let alone innovating for the good, because that's another key thing that we've seen happen in governance is we know that governance is not just about compliance, but it's about performance. But historically, and again, because of business as usual thinking, it's become very much about that compliance agenda. So then this is where the disconnect with strategy has come and why this is starting to be re-remembered. Because what we're also remembering again is the fact that any organization, and especially our large businesses, they're not just those groups of people that we endow with the possibility to take our resources and transform them. But they are our, our hope 
for innovating the solutions to the deep problems that we now have. So first and foremost, an organization is there to innovate something useful. And so that brings in that performance part, it brings in that strategy part, and it means the governing body need to step up. Just one thing I wanted to add there. Basically, sustainability, unsustainability is the biggest governance failure ever, because ultimately the economy was supposed to be delivering well-being for society, taking resources and transforming them for that. We then outsourced that to a set of assumptions that, that have actually taken us in another direction. No one was governing whether those assumptions actually were delivering the well-being for society. And we proxied those well-being outcomes to a short-term measure of GDP. Now, ultimately, society in any functioning democracy is the ultimate governing body. We choose a government that comes in as a governing body on our behalf to govern. And then in turn, that governing body of government govern the organizations that exist. At the moment, we have governance failures on all those levels. Now, if we busy ourselves with strategy and execution without being clear about our direction, overseeing that, and being accountable at all those levels from citizens, government down to organizations. We're not going to do it. We're going to feel quite nice that we've done a few nice things, but we're not actually going to achieve it and we're going to waste our time. So for me, governance has to be where the majority of the energy is put. We can't leave it by chance that we happen to have a few good CEOs. So governance is part of the failure in human management of the economy that has got us into the crisis we now face. But governance is part of the solution because good governance, better governance by boards will unlock this trap we've set for ourselves and unleash a very different transformational and progressive approach to how we create value in the economy. Victoria Hearth, thank you very much indeed for your expertise and your leadership in the realm of the ISO uh, standards, particularly ISO 37000, which I think is so valuable. And thank you also for your passion for governance and for sharing your expertise and your insights on this edition of the Board Leadership Podcast.